Okay. Excellencies, distinguished participants, a very warm welcome to this session titled Ensuring Food Security Sustainability, What Role for the Trade? Now, as the title suggests, um, we would be exploring the question of interlinkages between the trade and the food security and sustainability. The session is jointly organized by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the Institute, uh, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, and the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. Um, as, as the title, as I said, uh, suggested, we would try to explain um, uh, the linkage between the trade and food security, but in particular, how the policies and interventions shaping the trade and markets can contribute to food security and sustainability, particularly in the context of um, emerging challenges such as the climate change and COVID-19 pandemic. We have a very short time for this session, just one and a half hour. And above all, we are doing it virtually that has its own challenges. So my request to the speakers and participants is to make it as interactive as possible. And certainly I need cooperation from both sides. My name is Ahmed Mukhtar. I'm working with the FAO office in Geneva, and we have a very distinguished panel. We have uh, Dr. Martina Bozola, um, who's, who would be representing the academia and giving an academic perspective to this issue. We have uh, Jonathan Hepburn, he's senior policy advisor uh, at the IIST to give a think tank and analytical perspective. And we have Federica Angelucci from ITC who would be giving a perspective of implementation of the ground in this one. But above all, and we are really honored to have uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Cheryl Spencer, who is Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Jamaica to the UN and other international organizations in Geneva. She is a very well-known figure in the trade um, world, and she would be basically putting all of our dispersed thoughts together and in context and presenting uh, her perspective on the linkages between the trade and food security and sustainability. So um, without uh, further ado, I would start in this order, but I would request um, uh, the speakers to limit their um, interventions to about seven to eight minutes so that we have plenty of time for the follow-up questions and discussions from the floor. So first and foremost, I would request uh, Dr. Martina Bozola to give her perspective, which is more, let's say, an academic perspective um, to this topic of today. So over to you, Martina. Many thanks, many thanks, uh, Hamad, and welcome to all participants. I would uh, say an academic, very gentle introduction to this topic. And then my colleague, Jonathan Hepper, will continue with the broader introduction phase of this presentation. So next. We started actually, when we were conceptualizing this panel, we started thinking about the broad audience that could join. And then we, we were selecting literature and going on more complicated uh, literature review. And then we thought, why not, in fact, in order to foster discussion, go back to the basic. So we set the scene and we say, what is, in fact, the basic, the ABC of sustainability? Starting from, you can imagine, famous dictionary. And so here we were finding this, um, this uh, definition that you can see on the slide. So really sustainability has something to do, and there was a recurrent uh, wording time. So the quality of being able to continue over a period of time, that's an angle that is not often the first that may come to the mind. Um, when you think at sustainability. So, or the uh, quality of causing no litter or damage to the environment and therefore be able of continuing of time. So we really saw this uh, keeping uh, focus of the definition on environment and on time. Next. And then, of course, being a session on food security, we did the exercise also on the food security side. And here again, we have this time dimension coming up, which uh, mirror a bit what we saw for food security and here uh, for uh, sustainability. And here we speak really at food security as all people at all time and physical
physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to meet their, their dietary needs and food preference. That second part is also very important and active and healthy life. And we will see later, like, what does it mean for this session for our daily work and how does this um, relate to, to trade and sustainability in trade pattern? Next. Next. And here it is. So we felt that someone may be off when we focus on this literature and this definition focusing on the environment. And so we we go, we boil back to now the three pillars that we think most of the audience will be very familiar with, and they come over and over in the literature. What does it take to be sustainable? And here it is, sustainability is based on the three pillar, economics, social and environmental. And the moment you take out one of these three pillars from the concept, here it is, this dimension of over a period of time will be destroyed. And here it is why the, the three pillars are both essential. And in a way, those early definition that may focus only on one aspect, such as being the environment or being social, may not actually bring forward the policy, the, the action, the research that we really want to bring forward. Next. And so we ask ourselves, what does it take to continue over a period of time? And if we continue with that definition proposed uh, early away, and here we want to be a, a bit provocative, if we take the second part, so use of natural product and energy in a way that does not harm the environment. Is this enough? Is this enough or something is off in today's world? Today's world characterized by population growth, the Malthusian theories. And today, actually, uh, I don't know for those in the audience that were also in the uh, sustainability plenary earlier on today, for example, there were talks on transformational change needed in the face of a growing population. So can we just go for the business as usual in this context or rising living income of the existing population, changing consumption pattern, for example, towards higher, um, the literature tells us higher uh, meat consumption uh, for the population. And then, of course, the big challenge is that our uh, age phase, that is climate change, climate change where we need this duality, adapt to climate change. So here we say climate change is happening and we need to do something to counter in develop as uh, in OECD, in developing as these OECD countries, but also we need to mitigate climate change. So take action so that the rate of change in climate uh, will be uh, reduced and mitigated. And um, Finally, the, the big challenge that came up also this year, and this will uh, be related and uh, discussed more broadly later, it's about the effect of pandemic and how this may affect our trade trade patterns. So that's a bit the, the setting the scene. So what is sustainability and food security? What do we mean? Can we challenge the existing, um, the existing definition in the context of the challenges and the situation that we um, face nowadays. Next. And how we should consider this. So basically, how do we think, do we switch from the do not harm uh, phase from studying the impact? There is a quite rich literature studying the impact of climate change and demonstrating that for example, agriculture and other sector are impacted by climate change, the trade patterns may be impacted by climate change. And how do we uh, go now in our practical policy or uh, project work from the do not arm to really an approach that is proactive, inclusive and holistic so that we can take into account this definition of sustainability, food security and embrace them in our everyday work. And we will see in the next talks some possible case studies and more ad hoc discussion on some of these specific aspects, such as climate change and uh, pandemic. And really, without forgetting that sustainability must be over the three dimensions. We cannot have 
sustainability and speak only about economic sustainability or social or about the environment. You really need to embrace all the three pillars and that's a bit the, the basic uh, starting point together with the importance of time when we speak about this. Next. Fantastic. And now I pass the word to uh, our co-speaker, uh, Jonathan Hepper, who will look at this dimension with focus uh, on specific aspects. Now just touch upon. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much, Martina. Thank you, Ahmad. Uh, I hope it's okay for me to take the floor uh, at this point and dive into um, the question. Um, so Martina has really given us a fantastic overview. What do we mean by sustainability? What do we mean by food security? What do we mean by sustainable development? The three components, economic, social, and environmental, uh, for sustainable development, the definition of food security, and all of these different components. Um, let me just turn my feet back because I think there's a bit of feedback there. What I'm going to do is talk about how all this connects back to trade and trade pol policy. How is it relevant to achieving progress in these different areas? And what can governments do differently to move forward in today's market and policy environment? So I think we need to scroll back a little bit, five years back in time. We can't talk about sustainable development without talking about the sustainable development goals, Agenda 2030. In 2015, we had world leaders come together and agree 17 new commitments uh, a very bold set of commitments, which included action on hunger and malnutrition, ending hunger and malnutrition by 2030, as part of a package set out in the second of these sustainable development goals on hunger, nutrition, food security, and sustainable agriculture. Trade is part of this package. It's there clearly in SDG 17, the 17 sustainable development goals, which I think are interesting because they spell out very clearly that the world leaders when they met, and this was uh, the result of this big process that went on after the Rio plus 20 talks with the civil society and other groups feeding into the process. Trade is a means of implementation. It's not a, an end in itself, but rather a tool that governments can use, different actors in society can use to support the achievement of other uh, more fundamental goals, such as ending hunger or supporting nutrition and sustainable agriculture. What progress since then? So actually, very sadly, since 2015, progress on tackling hunger and malnutrition has been slipping backwards. Uh, latest figures um, from the FAO seem to suggest we're, we're looking at an estimated 700 million people who are hungry, and that the trend over the last few years has been in the wrong direction after some uh, sustained period of progress. So there's nothing inevitable about uh, going in one direction or another, but we do have to be conscious of this trend. On top of that, there's, a, I think, growing awareness of the connections between the food system and environmental challenges, whether it's biodiversity loss, climate change, land and water management, and so on. Why is this? Well, you look at conflict, extreme weather events, these are some of the things that uh, agencies like the FAO have highlighted in their analysis, but also the impact of the economic slowdown on this question, which Martina mentioned, access to food. We have to have food available, and we know that there is enough food available in the world, but because many people, millions of people, are too poor to be able to, to buy the food that they need, their access to food is impaired, and that's a very important part of the equation. What about COVID-19? Again, Martina mentioned pandemics. Uh, this is clearly something which is on everyone's minds right now. It's accentuated the challenges we face around food security and sustainable agriculture. Uh, I was in a, a session we were organizing, um, Geneva Trade Week session earlier today, where the um, African Union Commissioner, Commissioner Muchanga, with responsibility for trade and industry, was talking about how supply chains across Africa have been disrupted, the food value chains have been disrupted, partly because of all the different measures the governments have taken, and there's a series of ministerial statements this year that have come out saying how important it is to keep the food flowing from one place to another. Um, but the big impact of COVID has actually been more, in terms of the food security impact, it's been as much around the impact 
on people's jobs and on their incomes as uh, the, the effect of the lockdown has hit, and it also in other areas. So remittances have fallen. The tourism sector has been hit hard as people stop flying around the world, uh, taking holidays. So, and, and tourism is clearly part of trade and services. So the impact of trade on food security can be through not just trade in farm goods and food, but also trade in other sectors like services. And there are lots and lots of connections there. What can we expect from the future? So many regions of the world, if you look at the projections that are coming out of the economists, places like the FAO or the OECD, they say that the demand growth, the rate at which demand is going to grow, is set to outstrip the rate at which production is due to grow. That doesn't mean that domestic productivity growth is not important. It clearly is, and it's very important to many to, uh, the livelihoods of many people living in rural areas, many of whom are actually food insecure themselves. But it does mean that trade is going to be increasingly important in ensuring both food availability and access, especially for urban populations as average incomes rise and demand grows, and we have the demographic trends that Martina referred to. So is that sufficient? I'd argue, no, it's not. We have to recognize that food and agricultural markets remain poorly functioning and highly distorted. So, and this takes us back to the agenda at the WTO, and I think many of the things are, that I imagine Ambassador Spencer may, may touch upon in her remarks, we've got very large and growing levels of agricultural domestic support. Some of the highest, uh, highest income countries in the world have very high tariffs, uh, which affects the ability of trade, uh, of food to move around the world freely um, and for producers, including small producers, to be able to access markets. We have, and we've seen this in, co in the COVID crisis, food export restrictions, which have an impact on the ability of poor consumers in food importing countries to be able to access food when they need it. And there's this equity dimension. Major economies, when they impose measures on trade, trade policy measures, those have an outsized impact on vulnerable producers and consumers elsewhere, especially in low-income countries. And that's something which governments also, I would say, need to get to grips with. So what can governments do? Concluding remarks, um, there's a whole bunch of things that can be done outside trade, obviously, and that means things like social safety nets, things that uh, helping lift people out of poverty. Uh, there's a whole load of things around investment, investing in agricultural research, uh, supporting extension services uh, and so on, and also reinforcing environmental governance and making sure that there are proper regulations and systems in place for protecting the environment where that's needed. But in the trade sphere, and that's the focus of our discussion today, I'd say three things need to be done. Number one, rebuild trust. So trade wars and the Apple body crisis uh, at the WTO have all had an impact on trust, confidence, Many governments today, I think, are asking, is the multilateral trading system able to safeguard functioning and fair markets for food and agriculture? Secondly, uh, governments can also and should also agree a forward-looking agenda for action. We've got the next ministerial conference of the WTO coming up, MC12. We don't yet know the date, but we do know this will be an opportunity to set out some kind of a roadmap for where governments should be going and what the people in Geneva who are negotiating on trade ought to be doing. And thirdly, uh, I would say governments need to fast track action on deliverables in specific areas, whether it's domestic support, export restrictions, or wherever there is, wherever there is a consensus that can be found, governments need to act now on SDG2. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and particularly thank you for this. Um specific agenda items that you gave the three. Um, before going to Federica, let me mention a couple of things over here. Uh, to put things in context, uh, if you're interested to explore uh, the linkages between the trade and food security, uh, may I refer the two flagship publications by FAO, the uh, State of Agriculture Commodity Markets Reports 2016, that explored the trade and food security relationship, and the State of Agriculture Commodity Markets 2018, uh, export um, the relationship between trade, climate change, and food security. So if you're interested in this one, there's a lot of material, a lot of analysis over there, in addition to a lot of papers by IISD and certainly some of the ITC stuff as well. And I'm sure Martina, your university might have produced a lot of material as well. So this is just to put things in context, but 
Jonathan, thank you also for mentioning this important point that it is not only trade in goods, but trade in services as well. That should be kept in context when we talk about trade in overall context, but particularly in the context of food security as well. Because if we look at now, for example, this COVID-19 crisis, as we have seen until so far, the markets were more resilient than the previous shock, for example, 2008, 9 And one visible segment is the services, which is essentially the logistics. Logistics were relatively more resilient now because it was much more developed than before. So this is just to make a point. But now we go to the um, next presentation where we would have a, a practical example of an initiative by the International Trade Center, uh, and that will be presented by Federica, the ITC Alliances for Action. So over to you, Federica. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, as, uh, as Ahmad said, I will provide an overview of uh, what we do uh, as uh, Alliances for Action team from ITC, and especially on uh, projects that we have in different uh, countries uh, in the world in order to ensure uh, sustainability and the three dimensions of sustainability of which Martina uh, was talking about. Next, please. Next. Next. So, um, the Alliances for Action uh, approach uh, to sustainable value chain development includes five pillars. Uh, these five pillars uh, are basically the, the sequence that we normally follow uh, to develop specific sectors in, in selected countries. In all these pillars, we try to embed uh, environmental, social, and economic sustainability, uh, especially in the first pillar, where we try to gather all information about value chain, market opportunities, product innovation trajectories, but also gaps in sustainability from an environmental, social, and economic point of view. Uh, the other important aspect, uh, which is the second pillar, and is convene, uh, that we call convene, is essentially the phase where we try to strengthen partnerships uh, between different actors in the value chain from farm to fork in order to ensure the economic sustainability, essentially um, partnerships and uh, co-investment in specific projects uh, for the value chain development, which go behind the life of the project or the funding that they could receive from donors. The third component is about transforming. This mainly includes all the capacity building related to address specific gaps identified in the understand phase. And it also has a strong component related to uh, supporting responsible and sustainable production and trade. Uh, the fourth component is also very much focused on ensuring economic sustainability because during this phase, and thanks to convening stakeholders from the sector and behind, we try to identify potential co-investment uh, from uh, donors or the private sector and essentially de-risk investment and try to find solutions according to blended finance principles in order to ensure uh, sustainable, uh, sustainability of the project. And finally, uh, the assessment of impact. Uh, we, we, of course, follow uh, project log frames, but we try to go behind that by assessing uh, progress against indicators of sustainability from an environmental, social, and economic point of view. Next, please. Uh, going specifically into what we do in terms of social and environmental sustainability, we are recently, uh, we are working on a new framework, which consists in assessing all value chains in the in the all, uh, all stakeholders in the value chain uh, from farm to fork in terms of good governance, environmental integrity, economic resilience, and social well-being. This, of course, would be the basis to identify all those gaps in order to undertake um, a process of capacity building, which will uh, target trainers within the countries in order to build local capacities. And this will be followed by coaching and monitoring uh, 
uh, of these trainers in order to ensure sustainability and uh, embedding these principles into the value chain in the long term. Next. These are, uh, this is a list of the project, of the portfolio we have, uh, where we try, as I said, to embed these principles of sustainability. Uh, in addition to um, projects we have since uh, the long term in, uh, on cocoa and coffee in Ghana and Ethiopia, respectively, we started the second phase of the coconut project in the Caribbean, which involves 11 countries, including Jamaica, as well as other projects in West Africa and uh, the recently funded project we have in Iswatini. Next. What I will do now in order to provide an example on how we try to reconcil reconciliate and address these three aspects of sustainability and how this relates to, to more sustainable trade as well, I will provide and zoom in uh, the example of the Sankofa project in Ghana. The main objective of this project is to develop uh, a sustainable cocoa value chain. Uh, we are doing this in close partnerships uh, with local stakeholders, which include uh, farm to fork stakeholders. So the Kwapa Cocoa Farmers Union, which uh, has the majority of its production certified fair trade, as well as other certification, niche cocoa, so local processors, we are now basically addressing five different local processors of cocoa-derived products, but also the Young Development Council, because the focus of this project is, of course, the main cash crop, which is cocoa, but we try to target and develop market opportunities also for uh, crops that are associated to cocoa in, uh, in farming systems in Ghana. And Yam is one of the main ones and has a relevance um, both as a cash crop, but also as a food security crop. So the first area where we try to ensure sustainability is actually crop diversification, which is at the basis of climate smart and dynamic agroforestry uh, principles, which also uh, ensure and enhance uh, biodiversity and ensure reforestation. Uh, so this is at the production level uh, what we are trying to achieve, crop diversification, which in turn ensures income diversification, so diversification of sources of income from different crops, uh, but also uh, target different, uh, different products. So look into product innovation with uh, processors in order to uh, achieve and target, be able to target new markets. And this is done in a sustainable and ethical way because of the approach we have to production where we are piloting, as I said, climate smart agriculture as well as dynamic agroforestry. Next, please. Uh, this is a snapshot of the impact we have achieved so far. Uh, this can be uh, summarized into three different uh, components. The environmental impact uh, which can be revealed by the fact that uh, we have now 1,327 farmers who adopted sustainable farming practices. Uh, this is cocoa producing uh, farmers. Uh, the second uh, aspect of impact is mainly economic. The project has generated sales of cocoa of uh, 4.5 million in uh, 2019 because um, partnerships we try to establish are also with, with the end market in Europe in this case. So we identified um, buyers in Europe that are interested in sourcing sustainable products, such as, for example, uh, Coop in, in Switzerland. And uh, this is to say that we really try to work on sustainability along the value chain. Uh, in terms of income improvements, we also have to encounter uh, the fact that uh, farmers managed to sell and market uh, some associated crops to cocoa, such as yam, maize, and other um, crops such as plantain, for a value of $50,000 uh, in, $50, in 2019. And the most relevant social uh, impact that we managed to produce is uh, women uh, inclusion and empowerment. 1,120 women farmers transacted international business in 2019 because of the project. 
and perceived a premium of almost a factory premium of almost 1 million US dollars in 2019. Next, please. This is the final slide. Uh, I'm just showing you uh, the same uh, plot before the dynamic agroforestry was, was pilot tested. And uh, this is exactly the same plot and the same perspective after three months. Uh, the, the planting of trees and associated crops together with cocoa actually managed to, um, to avoid the use of fertilizer and chemicals and ensure uh, soil nutrition and, and uh, plant nutrition uh, just according to the combination of, of crops that are normally uh, included in a dynamic agroforestry plot. Uh, some final consideration to link to what the previous speaker said. First of all, um, how can policymakers reconcile the need to adopt climate change and at the same time ensure food security more sustainably? I think that what we crop diversification and diversification of the sources of income is one way to ensure not only biodiversity. Uh, from an environmental point of view, but also making uh, the business and cash crops production sustainable for farmers, which can also benefit from other uh, from income from the production and marketing of other crops, and in somehow uh, smooth their consumption and their income over time. Uh, the second aspect, which I think is really important, is to sensi sensitize policymakers. Uh, and buyers, so the private sector, to buy sustainable, uh, but not only on the international market, the EU market, the US market, or the Asian market, where there is already a strong um, awareness about the importance of sustainable agriculture. But also uh, do this type of promotion and sensitization on the national and, and regional markets, which especially after the pandemics, have become one of the main uh, targeted markets because more, more, more accessible. And uh, actually, in this regard, I think uh, policymakers should also look at the barriers, especially non-tariff barriers that are still affecting regional markets and that should be really discussed um, and, and reduced in order to, to promote this type of trade and look at opportunities which are more closer to the to developing countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federica. Thanks for sharing a practical example on how could we promote sustainability. And of course, if my bosses are uh, watching this event, they would scold me that why did we as FAO not made a presentation on this one? Because of course, all in all, what FAO is doing is to promote the sustainable agriculture the climate smart agriculture, deploying technologies in that. No, but I mean, th that was just uh, on one side, of course, that is our mandate and we are working on that one, but uh, your project is connecting these farmers to the market as well. Um, but of course, I would again refer to the uh, to these initiatives that I mentioned, uh, particularly the climate smart agriculture and the deployment of technologies to achieve the sustainable agriculture. Um, uh, before going to Ambassador Spencer, uh, this is uh, yet again an announcement that for the participants, if you have any questions, please do write in the question and answer box on your right side, or you can even write in the chat or afterwards, um, uh, if you would like to, uh, let's say, raise uh, a question with your uh, nice voice, you could raise hands and we can see how many we can adjust. So now, finally, as I mentioned, for our prime time presentation or our keynote presentation. We have Ambassador Cheryl Spencer. As you know, she's expert on trade. She's expert on the negotiations and whole whole lot in the commercial diplomacy. And uh, particularly coming from a region that is uh, quite, let's say, uh, volatile in terms of the climate change and so on and so forth. So I'm sure that she has many perspectives um, and many things and she can actually combine all of these perspectives that we uh, that the previous speakers mentioned you know the academic the analytical and the uh, and the, uh, the un perspective let's say the policy intervention perspective so without further ado it is over to you ambassador spencer good afternoon and thank you very much ahmed and good afternoon to everyone 
Um, Jamaica is pleased to participate in this event and wish to thank the organizers, not only for the initiative, but also for the invitation. I uh, wish to contribute to the presentations throughout my, um, my own presentation. I will be flagging a few issues that were raised by all three excellent uh, uh, presentations. Professor Bozola, uh, uh, Federica Andalucci, and Jonathan Hepper. I think they were quite excellent, and I was actually enthralled and making notes just to see how it's linked um, with what I would like to say. Now, uh, one of the first questions which I, I believe I'm guided to address, which is how can policymakers reconcile the need to adapt to climate change with the objective of ensuring food security? Uh, more uh, more sustainably, sorry. And Professor Bozolo, in fact, mentioned some of these issues and also emphasized the three pillars. And I, in my, as I start, I will be dealing with the issue of climate change, which of course is linked to sustainable agriculture. So let me start by recognizing that the impact of climate change is of such that it's being felt globally from increased frequency to natural disasters, to animal and plant diseases, and to uh, increase in global temperatures. And no doubt agriculture is severely affected. When agriculture is negatively affected, so too is the livelihood of small farmers and their dependents. Those dependent on agricultural value chain and overall a country's food security are also affected. I can tell you about Jamaica's own experience quickly with Hurricane Dean, for example, in 2007, which wiped out banana exports for many years. And in fact, in just over 10 years, and after 11 hurricanes, natural disasters have cost Jamaica over 1.2 billion US dollars in recovery expenditure. So for a small developing country, one can imagine um, how deleterious that impact has been. As our discussion focuses this afternoon on food security, I will just try to limit my input to this area and to provide my perspective on the trade dimension, including in the context of COVID-19. And I believe Jonathan uh, actually did very well and mentioned trade as a tool that can be used for sustainable agriculture and development. Within that toolbox, there is domestic support as one of the aspects. And certainly, you also mentioned uh, the issue of subsidies. Trade distorting subsidies is, of course, the biggest danger to agricultural production and trade. At the same time, the WTO agreements on agriculture, although in need of reform, it provides a space for members to provide non distorting support for agriculture. In light of the impact of climate change, governments need policy space to attend to the issue of disaster recovery, adaptation, and mitigation for their agriculture sector. And that is linked to the implementation of SDG 2. Through green boxing entitlements, such as paragraph eight of annex two of the agreement on agriculture, governments are able to provide support for inter-area agricultural infrastructure and other forms of supports, such as those to assist or incentivize crop diversification as mentioned by Federico. There's also Article 6.2, which is what we describe as a development article, a very critical article in the Agreement on Agriculture. And um, this assists agriculture and rural development, investment subsidies, etc., linked to diversification. So you can see the linkage there. And in fact, within the context of the WTO, there is no uh, a call for this article to be um, to be uh, stopped. And that is something that we are watching very closely because it's actually one of the few articles that some development developing countries are able to um, have access to in terms of what can be provided to their, uh, their agriculture sectors. There is also uh, um, irrigation systems which are needed to respond to increasing frequency of droughts and loan and other assistance programs to assist small producers to respond to the damage caused by climatic events. 
Simultaneously, there's a need to incentivize and support a production shift from fossil fuel to new techniques such as renewable energy technology, which also reduces the cost of production and eventually consumer price of agriculture and agro-processing products for the general population. And this is intrinsically linked to food security, especially in the context of access. Um, at the same time, there are trade distorting support programs disguised as green box support, which creates competitive pressure on developing country markets for like products and could displace their production beads and hence long-term food security. That is why the members of the ACP group, for example, is calling for stricter disciplines um, on, on green box support to prevent what we call the practice of uh, box painting and which I myself call box repainting. We should be cautious about proposals for a cap on green box support since disaster recovery expenditure for a single climatic event can use up all of our green box entitlement. The green box flexibility should be available to policymakers in developing countries seeking to develop policies to develop to, to respond to the impact of climate change, which intensifies as the years progress. There's also the issue of tariffs, and Jonathan mentioned that as well. That is especially increasing applied tariffs to bond rates, and that is another tool that, uh, to which countries have access. However, in agriculture trade, there is a wide gap between applied and bond rates, especially for developing countries. So this brings to the fore the issue of um, how this affects food security and um, also in the in, and also um, assist farmers, especially regarding surplus produce. This has come to the fore, particularly within the context of the pandemic. Now, how can trading goods and services contribute to food security in the context of COVID-19, of a COVID-19 challenge? And how can trade policy framework better address food system shocks? In terms of the contribution to trade, of trade to food security in the context of COVID-19 and averting food system shocks, it is important to emphasize that the pandemic has exposed the vulnerability of developing countries. Due to COVID-19, developing countries, including ACP group members, anticipate a fall-off in agricultural production and trade as a result of inter-alien mandatory quarantine, social distancing rules, export restrictions, disruption in global supply chains and logistical arrangements, and I believe Jonathan mentioned some of those. This will no doubt shock food systems and adversely affect food security and livelihood. We are experiencing increase in inventory due to reduction in market demand, emanating from lockdown policies, which has resulted in significant losses by our local producers, especially, sorry, particularly relating to perishable produce, especially those resource poor farmers with no access to food storage facilities or technologies. Developing countries, especially small and vulnerable economies and net food importing developing countries are disproportionately affected. Additionally, many developing countries are experiencing clogged ports and storage facilities, limitations in discharge capacities at ports, and importantly, limited availability of passenger flights to and from our countries that are normally used to transport fruits and vegetables to export markets. These issues lead to at least two scenarios, which could threaten the implementation of SDG2. One, declining production, and hence declining food availability locally, which is a food security risk to the developing countries with already, already poor production structures. And two, less availability of food for net food importing developing countries due to declining COVID induced global production, weaker export markets as a result of economic decline, leading to less foreign exchange earnings for developing countries to purchase food imports and disruption in global supply chains. For my own region, Caribbean community CARICOM, for example, we have responded to the COVID-induced challenges 
by undertaking a study of the situation on the ground and establishing a framework to facilitate dialogue among regional governments to map areas of food shortages with areas of surpluses in the region. The region is also seeking to use e-commerce to help the development of the agriculture sector. And in fact, in Jamaica, my home country, we had the first farmer's market uh, totally virtually um, recently. In light of the challenges posed by COVID-19, the WTO has a role to play in guaranteeing food security. And cushioning shops, to developing countries' food systems. This can be done in the following ways. First, we think WTO members should exercise due, exercise due restraint in adopting restriction measures, and when such measures are inevitable, members have a duty to ensure that they are proportional, they are temporary and targeted, and adopted in a manner that will have the least impact on net food import in developing countries. These are principles espoused by Article 12 of the Agreement on Agriculture and complementary to our collective commitment to zero hunger, to the zero hunger objective of SDG 2. The adoption of large stimulus packages globally is a concern for food security in the long term. While large stimulus uh, packages similar to food production sector could ease shortages, it could also negatively affect the medium to long-term local production of like products in less resourced developing countries, importing these heavily subsidized products. Hence, it could aggravate the impact of the pandemic by incentivizing imbalances in global agricultural trade. It is important to preserve policy space to, to promote domestic production, which is essential to food security. The WTO members, uh, membership has a duty to ensure that supply chains remain open to facilitate movement of agricultural products, inputs, and agricultural workers across borders in order to prevent food shortages and maintain market balance. We wish to emphasize that emergency measures related to agriculture and agri-food products designed to tackle COVID-19, if deemed necessary, it should be WTO compliant, it should be targeted, should be proportionate, should be transparent and temporary, and not create unnecessary barriers to trade. And flowing from that unnecessary barriers to trade, we should refrain, governments should refrain from non-tariff barriers. And one of those is the whole issue of uh, MRLs, for example, maximum residue levels in a lot of agricultural products. WTO members should support the efforts of the WTO and other international organizations in analyzing the impact of COVID-19 on global agriculture and agri-food trade and production with a view to making the necessary policy responses. And this builds confidence in the role of the WTO as, as well as enhances the coherence which the, the WTO has been striving for for many, many years. COVID-19 highlights the urgency to address the long outstanding issues, such as PSH, public stock holding, and the special safeguard mechanism in the agriculture negotiations in the WTO. And when I mentioned previously the whole issue of raising applied rates to bond rates, this is um, a mechanism that would be required by developing countries uh, to cushion the shock uh, of, of, um, of uh, applied and bond rates or to allow for us to be able to do that. Due to the economic impact of COVID-19, we would well find ourselves in a position where we have to implement new PSH programs in which governments are forced to procure at administrative prices to deal with COVID-19-induced food security challenges. Such a practice, if adopted, would not be accommodated by the Bali Peace Clause or the Green Box entitlement. In terms of the SSM, we have already seen where local food surpluses due to lockdown of markets could not be averted by reliance on solely increase, increasing applied tariffs to bond levels. Finally, it is important to have ongoing dialogue to improve our preparedness and responsiveness to regional or international pandemic, including multilateral action to address issues such as trade distorting, domestic support, and the impact of the disposal of subsidized stocks 
at a time when our producers are under immense pressure as a result of COVID-19. The food security of a nation, as you are aware and would agree, is a sacred duty of governments. SDG 2 reflects this reality. The double threats posed by climate change and COVID-19 significantly erodes developing countries' ability to respond to shocks to food systems. And certainly from Jamaica's perspective and even the Caribbean, we can speak of that firsthand because we are in the hurricane season at this very time and are very concerned up to November about having a double whammy um, impact of climate change or natural disaster on top of the pandemic. Jonathan also mentioned the issue of rebuilding trust. While it is understandable that some trade restricting measures would be required in extraordinary circumstances, WTO members should ensure that their policies do not negatively impact the ability of NFIDCs to safeguard their food systems. The WTO has and should play a key role in this regard. And looking forward towards MC12, which we uh, have targeted in June 2021, I believe this could provide an opportunity to do a lot of work. Um, it could provide an opportunity to reinforce the WTO's efficacy uh, in the issue of food security. It could also provide an opportunity to agree uh, various options and outcomes that point to the WTO as the premier organization to address food security, trade, and, and I It's a mouthful, but I hope I was here, but I will stop there for the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Spencer. I mean, you've given us uh, quite a lot, I would say, but extremely prescriptive and relevant points. Thank you very much for that. I think that would provide us uh, a very good basis for discussion, taking it further. Uh, if you allow me to pick a couple of points that you mentioned in your intervention, I think this regional focus that you said, or the regional type of solutions that is making quite a lot of waves nowadays, and the use of technology, particularly the digital technologies as well. You also mentioned about the policy space, uh, particularly the Green Box, Article 6.2 of the Agreement of Agriculture. Uh, we have done a couple of you know, opinion papers on that one. I have uh, listed those in the chat box over here for everyone. There was one official paper on the policy space for sustainable agriculture, uh, looking at the Green Box, if it really allows you. Uh, but uh, it basically corresponds to the points that you mentioned, Ambassador. And there was another personal opinion paper on balancing the global food security equation, where I have uh, figured out this equation T3 over C3, the points you mentioned. The three T's are the trade, technology, and territorial productivity on the positive side of equation. But the negative side of equation is the conflicts, the climate change, and now the COVID-19 that is hampering. So how can we use the three T's in order to counter the three C's. But thank you, I think we, we have a very good ground for discussion now, but I'm wondering uh, whether participants are going to give any of the questions in the q and I do not see, maybe I can see, um, uh, seek the support from the uh, GTW team. If uh, any of the participants would like to ask question in person by raising their hands. So could you kindly identify if there is anyone who is raising their hands? or if anyone has written it separately. If not, then in the meantime, um, okay, let's wait for a minute or so. If there is any volunteers. So I'm sure the presentations were fantastic, but you know, normally when we participate in any of the session, sometimes just out of curiosity, we ask a question. And if not, then out of formality, because we are sitting in Geneva. <laughs> so the floor is open. If there is any, if no questions, then if you allow me, oh no, I, I think we, we have uh, a question probably. Yes, Leonardo Bento. So I can read the question. I don't know uh, if other speakers can see. So the question from Leonardo Bento is that, how do the panelists assess a multilateral agreement not to impose export prohibitions or restrictions on food stuff purchased for non-commercial humanitarian purposes by the World Food Program to be negotiated and adopted at the WTO. As you know, this is one of the areas which is already under discussion in the WTO. So Leonardo Bento is asking uh, the, the panelists' opinion on that. 
So who would go first? I'm sure Ambassador Spencer has been dealing with this issue day in, day out. So if you would like to start Ambassador. Ambassador Spencer, uh, could, you, could you hear us? You're muted. Ahmed, oops. Yes, I apologize. It seems to be going on and off. Could you just um, repeat for me the question, Ahmed? Just ask. Yes, yes, please. Uh, the, the question is uh, from Leonardo Bento. He's asking that how do you see or assess the possibility of a multilateral agreement for not imposing export prohibitions or restrictions on the food stuff purchased for non commercial humanitarian purposes? by the World Food Programme. As you know, this is already under discussion in the WTO. Mm -hmm. So your views on that? Yeah. No, of course, this is um, one of the issues that is on the discussion in the WTO. Um, it's a very important issue for not only poorer countries, but countries in conflict situations, countries who are dealing with currently with the pandemic, etc. Um, certainly, we believe that it is one of those um, low hanging fruit uh, for MC12. We think it's achievable. And therefore, we certainly from the ACP group perspective, we are working hard to contribute to the discussions to arrive at a multilateral agreement in that regard. So uh, that would be just what I would say. It is achievable. I believe there's goodwill um, on this in the WTO. Thank you, Ambassador. Any other panelists would like to jump on this question? Jonathan, please. Yeah, if I could just jump in. I mean, I agree entirely with Ambassador Spencer. This should be one of the low hanging fruit for the next ministerial conference. It's exactly the sort of thing that I had in mind when I was talking about deliverables, uh, the areas where members ought to be able to find some consensus and actually demonstrate that the process of the WTO is delivering in real, very concrete ways for people facing humanitarian emergencies. I mean, when we talk about the WFP humanitarian food aid, uh, Ahmed, you can probably uh, be more eloquent than I can on this topic, but we're, we're talking about people who are in refugee camps, who are in crisis situations, in real humanitarian emergencies, and who simply don't have enough food to eat. And it's very difficult to, to to understand how countries might uh, want to make it more expensive for the WFP to actually step in and provide uh, food aid to people that would otherwise be the case. Uh, and export restrictions are clearly one of those mechanisms which do have the effect of raising the price of food. If you apply that to the purchases of food, the humanitarian food aid, um, from the um, from the country that's imp imposing those restrictions. I mean, I guess the good news is the G20 has agreed this year this is something that should be doable. That's all the major economies. Uh, they did the same thing in 2011. I mean, at some point you have to say, what are, what are the ministers and the leaders actually doing? It's nice to have these declarations. They're very important. They do demonstrate political will. But at the end of the day, we need to be able to bring the results of those declarations back to the WTO and turn them into something that's actionable. So when the WFB is helping these people in crisis situations, they can actually do it to the best of their ability. Thanks. Thank you. Martina, you want to come in? Uh, yes, a couple of words more than the uh, research going on from the research perspective at the, at the moment, although not strictly related with humanitarian purpose. So what is going on at the moment on the research are is that um, there is there are quite a lot of study emerging to look at the effect of temporary bounds on agri-food a product and basically some of these studies they look back at the 2007-2008 food price prices when there was also some temporary restriction although there are very fundamental differences in these two periods so a uh, one-to-one uh, -one comparison should not be done and is not opportune for a series of of reason and some of what these findings preliminary findings seems to agree is that even temporary bans or temporary restriction may have unwanted long lasting effects. So that's something to, to be considered in the negotiation and unwanted 
effects, including on uh, food and nutrition security outcomes. So that's a bit, of course, this research is very novel and is still ongoing. And as I say, we cannot just take the research done in 2008, about the 2008 and 7 uh, food crisis prices, but that's where um, academics are, are looking at among other things related to this. Thank you, Martina. Federica, do you have any points or I can come for, to you for next question? Yeah, just, just a small point about the other question that was raised about the issue of sustainability uh, Federica, and global... Sorry. Sorry, but if you don't mind, if you don't mind, let's close this question and then we go to the next one. I if don't have any this. particular observation on this one. No, yeah. I just want to add uh, one small thing on the WFP, uh, you know, th uh, sorry, the food um, purchase for the humanitarian purposes. Just to supplement the points that were mentioned um, previously by Ambassador, I mean, all three uh, basically panelists, we have to keep in mind one thing when we are talking about this export prohibitions or others. This type of, you know, procurement that is done by the WFP is targeted to people who are in extreme humanitarian need. We also know that in the recent years, the number of hungry people has have gone quite high. And recently, you might have heard, you know, this statement that we might be expecting a famine of biblical nature if we do not do any action um, as a result of the COVID-19. And there are prolonged conflicts and so on and so forth. So please keep in mind, you know, when we talk about these type of so-called solutions or restrictions, that the people on which these food is targeted do not have an option. In normal trade theory, we understand that there might be options for probably expensive uh, food or, you know, some alternatives or so on and so forth. But with these people, we do not have options. So please keep in mind this humanitarian perspective whenever there's a discussion. Sorry to hold you, Federica, but the next question is, I think, probably more relevant to you and maybe Jonathan as well. So the question um, is basically about this uh, minimum sustainability standards. I mean, the question is that if there could be international effort to introduce minimum sustainability standards on food products, uh, and uh, what are the major challenges in this area? And I'm sure you will be mentioning about the voluntary sustainability standards and so on and so forth, but I would add a bit in the end as well. So over to you, Federica, please go ahead. Yes, so the issue of uh, what the issue that was raised re refers to uh, sustainability of global value chain. So on, on, a, on a value chain on which domestic uh, go national governments do not have full control, what we are doing um, as, as International Trade Center, we are trying to advocate for the adoption of sustainability principles within uh, national, uh, national policies as a first step. As a second step, we are trying to promote a traceability system, which starts from the producer and uh, arrives to the end consumer thanks to digitalization, digitalization of the value chain. But this, of course, doesn't substitute for certification. Uh, in this regard, I think it's always very relevant what stated in the G20 paper about global value chain sustainability, which basically states that transformative policies in this uh, in this context have have to be global. So I would say that WTO has a, has a strong role on that. This is what. Thank you, Federica. Uh, Jonathan, would you like to add anything? And then I'll go to Mr. Spencer with a reformed, a reformed question on this one. Um, thanks, Ahmed. I mean, we have an entire work area at IASD which is dealing very specifically with this, this question of voluntary sustainability standards, looking at whole areas of specific commodities, cocoa, coffee, tea, etc. And uh, I have colleagues who are working uh, full time on that question. If the questioner wants to get in touch, I'd be more than happy to link up uh, my colleagues with uh, with the person asking this question and try and join the dots on that one. Because uh, yeah, we have a lot of resources there, and I'm sure they might be of interest. Um, Ahmed, I had another comment on the this issue of export restrictions uh, and food security, which I could could add now, or if you prefer, I can come back to it later. So please go ahead. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I just wanted to sort of pick up on what Martina was saying, which I think is very important. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that 
humanitarian food aid and export restrictions is just a subset of the broader issue of food security and uh, trade policy, and, and, and more specifically, food security and export restrictions. So clearly, there are complex ways in which export restrictions affect producers and consumers both at home, in the country that's applying the measures, and uh, also overseas, uh, abroad, um, especially in food importing countries. So there are different impacts, and there are different impacts also over time. And those go way beyond this, this question about the WFP, which, which as Ambassador Spencer said, it should be a, a sort of low hanging fruit. There's a much more complex set of questions there. And I think it would be very useful if um, WTO members could start taking a forward looking perspective on how trade and trade policy could serve a role in responding to and anticipating responses to food system shocks. This is an area where we're currently doing some research. COVID is at the front of our minds, but we know that climate change is going to mean there will be a lot more extreme weather events in the years ahead. There'll be more intense extreme weather, weather events, whether it's droughts or floods or fires, tropical storms or whatever and all those things will have impacts on how markets function i think um that, that's one of the reasons why in my, my three takeaways for, for recommendations on policy i did say that countries need a forward-looking agenda with the emphasis on forward-looking uh, it's very easy for wto negotiators to spend a lot of time looking back past mandates negotiating declarations footnotes in documents that were adopted many years ago and we know already that because of climate change the future won't look like the past and this is one of the ways in which it won't look like the, the past there'll be more uh, of these extreme weather events but we need to start thinking differently about risk about food system shocks and about whether countries have the, the tools to use Ambassador Spencer's metaphor the tools in their toolbox to respond but at the same time not export shocks and volatility onto other countries, onto other markets, and in particular, to make sure that we have in place the mechanisms we need to make sure that the most vulnerable producers and consumers aren't adversely affected when the major players uh, adopt particular types of policy measures, uh, uh, whether it's on export restrictions or other things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thanks, and looking forward to that research or analysis that you That's mentioned. My, that, may I come in after Jonathan? Absolutely, <laughs> Ambassador. Over to you. I think he was making um, some very um, poignant uh, comments there. I just wanted to add. Yes. Uh, I didn't hear Jonathan because I, for some reason my internet um, is, is uh, weakening, but I know that you were uh, treating with the whole issue of how trade can deal with um, you know, some of these shocks, especially from climate change and uh, you know the kinds of tools and mechanisms that we can look at. And of course, coming from a, a region, not just from Jamaica, but a region that um, this is always uppermost in our minds and we have this existential issue. I mean, Jamaica can't move from where it is, so we always have to be um, prepared and we are battered by this. Um, one of the issues we have been fighting, and in fact, within the context of the DG race, we have been raising that as, uh, as, as a, not only awareness, but also um, to highlight that whoever comes in, we are going to go hard and fast and furious on this issue because the WTO has never really managed it. We have been having this um, once a year forum where we have an exchange of views and discussions but not really tackling it and so the the, the committee on agriculture the synergy between that and the cte um how can they collaborate and have to to enhance the sustainability of agricultural trade in the context of agricultural trade um how can the wto in the context of um its quest for coherence how can it work with uh, different organizations like the FAO to be able to assist us um, with that? So I think this agenda will be um, becoming a lot more focused, certainly from our point of view, because there's nothing that can go in silos anymore. The pandemic has shown us that um, it's important for us to uh, raise the bar as the organization, as the WTO, but rather those just um, negotiation and rule making, or to deal with real bread and butter, bread and butter and day-to-day -day issues. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ambassador. Now, if I understand correctly um, to the organizers, I think we have one raised hand from the participants. Is that correct? And if so, if you can kindly unmute the participant, I think it's the name that I can see is Sparsha. May I request the... Yeah, hi. Thank you for the wonderful presentations, everyone. Um, my question was whether the WTO membership has the appetite to reform the domestic support disciplines under the agreement, or would a focus on TSH be more practical at this point? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think everyone can go with that one, but probably Ambassador Spencer to start with. Ambassador Spencer, uh, could you hear the question, please? No, I, I think she's having a connectivity issue. Ahmad? Yes. Uh, can can you hear now? Uh, did you hear the question? I can hear you now. Yes. I, were you were you asked were you calling on me there? <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, there was a question from the participants, and uh, uh, I think yes. Madam Sparsha, she was. I answering. heard the question. Okay. Um, okay. I believe she was saying whether the WTO should deal with more with uh, PSH as opposed to um, domestic support. Yes. Yes, please. Yes. I mean, in our view, I believe we need to try to deal with all of them, um, especially those issues that are currently on the table, which include um, domestic support, SSM, PSH, etc. I believe they're all safeguards in some way. Um, and therefore, while we need the PSH at this point, while we want to ensure that we can cover new programs, but we also need to deal with the issue of domestic support. We also need to deal with the issue of special safeguard mechanism. Um, so I, I believe that the, from, depending on which country you are from and what you are pursuing, I believe that there is a view or there is an, a, an, an important um, uh, 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 nexus and a way in which we need to address them going forward. Not a too heavy a package but to be able to look at them across the board and that they become a, a, a package. Because if you don't deal with the issue of SSM, for example, then I, the market access issues that have emerged, we will not be able to, 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 to take that on. And we must deal with the domestic support issues for protection, and we must deal with the PSH issues. So I just say, even the issue of cotton, um, we I think there's a, a, a role to play for that at this time. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Any other panelists? Martina, Federica, Jonathan, would you like to address this question? Okay. I'm, happy to, I'm happy to chip in if it's helpful. I think the ambassador's really um, addressed this. I mean, I, I don't know whether everyone on the call is familiar with some of the terms that the questioner is using. So PSH, this is the, the issue of public stockholding. Uh, a large number of developing countries have questioned whether uh, the existing set of rules of the WTO under the Agreement on Agriculture allow developing countries the room that they need to uh, procure food at prices set by the government, minimum support prices, um, without running into limits that have been set on the maximum amount of domestic support that can be provided. And so um, when the question is res responding to this, um, the question is ra raising this question uh, whether more needs to be done in that area, there was an agreement at the, the Nairobi Ministerial Conference that the countries would pursue negotiations on that topic. The, the, um, the, the question also re refers to the issue of domestic support, which is what are the levels of support that can be provided under the, the framework that exists at the moment. Um, and it, this is essentially a political question, as I think is implicit in the in the question that's being framed here in the, in the chat that we've seen. So um, it may be easiest to respond to some of these things uh, as packages. And I think that seemed to be 
seems to be where Ambassador Spencer is, is taking us with her reflections there, that actually if we deal with the issues together, we're more likely to get the traction uh, on moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Martina, Federica, any, any views on this one? Or? I'm fine. All right, thank you. Um, as we are waiting for a further question, if you allow me to go back to one of the questions that was asked on the sustainability standards. I think it is quite um, quite um, an important topic nowadays. Um, so far, we have seen a majority of the voluntary sustainability standards, and uh, there are quite a number, by the way. There are over 400 sustainability standards only in the food and agriculture sphere, uh, which is quite huge, you know, if you look at the certification schemes, the individual or the private certification schemes. But now the question over here was that whether you want to have, you know, the minimum type of sustainability standards. Now, if I can put in context that a lot of countries have incorporated in their national regulatory or the standards frameworks, they have already incorporated the sustainability standards. Um, the country that we are sitting in Switzerland is quite known for that because recently they had a referendum to ensure much more sustainability in food and agriculture. EU is quite, um, a leader in that, if I can use that terminology, and many other countries as well. But at the same time, there is a different angle to this discussion as well. For some countries or some exporters, this may become another sort of barrier to trade or to export, uh, particularly because the smallholder farmers may not be able to get those certification so certifications from the private certification schemes and so on and so forth, because they might be either not available or expensive or so on and so forth. So this is an open debate. Um, I don't know, I mean, what, what is your take on that? Because of course, when we talk about the WTO, we, we talk only or, or the public uh, sector standards. That means the requirements that are introduced by the governments, which are covered by the SPS and TBT agreements. But what to do about the private standards, what to do about these voluntary standards, which may not be discussed in the WTO, although some of the member countries have already introduced these ideas that this should be discussed in a, in a much better fashion. Um, but so far, we do not have the success. I know that um, ITC's uh, program, the T for SD, the Trade for Sustainable Development, has put together a very good compilation of these standards called the Sustainability Map. If you go to that tool, it basically lists out all of the sustainability standards that are out there. We also have the United Nations Forum on Sustainability Standards, which is a combination of five agencies, FAO, UNCTAD, ITC, UN Environment, and UNIDO. So we are basically working uh, to support countries in, in having more on the regulatory side, not on the standards development per se. So this is quite a complex discussion. And if I can be a bit blunt, I think oftentimes when we talk in the hardcore trade negotiations, this is a relatively ignored area. But if you look at the impact, the impact is quite huge. Uh, the impact particularly on the smallholder or the potential exporters. So I have basically, uh, let's say, contextualized this question or expanded this question and throwing it back to the panel. If you would like to have a take on that, particularly the, the specific question that was asked over there, whether you see a merit in introducing a minimum sustainability standard at the global level. That means, as, let's say, a codex type of a standard or a food safety type of a standard that has a global benchmarking. W what are your views on that? So the floor is open. I don't know who would like to go first. Um, I'd like to, to, to mention something here that um, in the, you you mentioned the, the threats and I, I do agree with with your uh, analysis on the other side what we are seeing is also emerging opportunities where the focus is shifting a bit to actually corporate social responsibility and private sector taking directly on board also through the push of civil society uh those standards even if sometimes not subscribing officially and directly uh, to to the, the existing one, and uh, so that that's a bit a trend that, as you rightly mentioned, policymakers should and I think will take more and more into account into their decision making process, and um, and this I think we we are observing this at all values of the value chain when you observe we see even traders 
that may be not related directly with consumer, they still uh, taking on board uh, sustainability standard, including the, the rising of sa uh, safety, food safety. Uh, we didn't speak today a lot about also food safety angle, but that's uh, an important and increasing area of, of observation. So, you know, and this in turn can become an opportunity, opportunity to create linkages uh, within the value chain of the type, for example, Federica mentioned, um, and really strengthen collaboration along the value chain and also opportunity for producing country if these links uh, somehow manage to be done and be created. Thank you, Martina. Thank you. And Ahmad, yes, if I could add, if I could add one element which is important uh, to address the issue of the adoption of the sustainability standard by smallholder, uh, I think that an important uh, mean is actually the the association they belong to. Uh, farmer association are an important aggregator, and can actually, and this is what we are actually doing. We are trying to strengthen and improve governance of uh, this farmer association, which associates 100,000 uh, smallholders in some regions in Ghana. And they are basically uh, accepting this support to improve their governance and also uh, to improve their expertise in, this, in these topics. So they are co-investing into, this, into these uh, principles and transferring it to their members. Thank you, Federica. Quite an important point, because if you look at these sustainability standards, particularly in the area of forestry and fisheries, the aggregator or let's say the cooperatives play a vital role, because otherwise the individual players are really small. Um, I don't know if Ambassador Spencer or Jonathan, you would like to add anything on this one on the issue of sustainability standards? or the benchmarking of sustainability standards? Okay. Uh, um, if you're talking about private standards, Ahmad, I think this is something that we are being grappling with sometimes, um, mainly because of the lack of regulation. Huh? I believe we need to have a discussion on how to deal with it, um, because while it is, uh, an opportunity, and I am a coffee grower, or we are coffee growers, for example. So we know the opportunities that arise, but also it adds to the whole compliance outfit, the compliance cost, cost to developing countries. And sometimes the standards are even higher than what um, developing countries can bear, as you can imagine. So I know that there are some WTO members who have been calling for the WTO to um, step in to try to, to regulate. I believe, though, it would have to be um, exploratory at the beginning just to see the pros and the cons of uh, what would be affected and what would not. And sometimes it's difficult to get the WTO involved in many things. Um, somehow it takes on a different um, perspective. But I think at least to uh, really look at it closely, and I mean, you mentioned that you have done some work, uh, Ahmad, I think you were saying. Unfortunately, my internet again gives trouble. But um, I believe that it's something that we need to continue to look at um, in terms of uh, how we can um, regulate it so that it doesn't become, it doesn't have the opposite effect. Okay, thank you very much, Ambassador. And on your last point, um, you know, somehow it's not that I have to justify my salary as well. It, the FAO gives me. If you look at the latest State of Agriculture Commodities Report 2020, uh, we have touched upon the agriculture value chains in this one, and one segment particularly deals with the sustainability in agriculture value chains. So, this question, I would um, basically request everyone to look into that, and we have discussed this voluntary, uh, voluntary or the sustainability or private sustainability standards and how could they play on the both sides. You know, it's not really conclusive, but we have covered that discussion. That was uh, this latest state of agriculture commodity markets was released on 23rd of September. It is available on our website, a very fresh report. You can check either on FU Geneva or the global FU website. Now we have very few minutes left. So finally, as we always say, 30 seconds for each panelist for the final words of wisdom or the golden words. 
And if you allow me, I can reverse the order now and start with Ambassador Spencer. Very quickly, final 30 seconds, the take home message on this topic, please. Well, quickly, having had this discussion, um, we are looking forward towards MC12 and looking at the kinds of outcomes that we want. And some of them we have already mentioned um, domestic support, the whole issue of disciplines on the green box, preserving the Article 6.2 on development, which is um, a very important um, article that helps us to diversify, the issue of special safeguard mechanism, the, is the issues of the appellate body. Um, sorting that out, um, the issue of cotton as a ACP coordinator, um, I have to constantly remind of that, and the whole issue of uh, PSH, and we are looking forward to a, a package um, which would also be managed in a way to take, on, um, to take account of the pandemic um, in which we are now um, operating. And thank you very much, Ahmed, for uh, this very important segment. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ambassador. 30 seconds, Federica. So thanks a lot. Uh, my my take on uh, lessons from today's discussions uh, are really about um, keeping on working on the sustainability aspects and try to embed them as much as possible uh, in the work that we're doing, basically working on global value chains for traditional exports, but also for non-traditional exports, which are normally products that smallholder farmers uh, produce in combination with, with the main and traditional uh, cash crops. And then, of course, I can offer you to collaborate with us on sustainability at production level. If you want, we can continue the discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, we, we always would do that. Uh, Jonathan, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> Thanks, Ahmed. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been a great discussion. Um, I, I just say a few things. We've got 10 years left to reach the SDGs. Let's try and make sure that trade and trade policy contributes towards our efforts to move in that direction to an achieve SDG 2 and also contributes to our efforts to respond to the threats and uh, the climate change represents and, uh, and to respond to the challenge of the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then finally, Martina, over to you. Thank you very much. And then as last thought, I'd like to mention that, that it's true climate change is, is a threat, is a risk, but uh, it's also opportunity to really get, you know, all stakeholders together to really take action because there is this underlying uh, topic that is there no matter which policy or which value chain we look at. So uh, let's uh, see it as a threat, but also as an opportunity to bring us for, uh, for concerted actions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. So, Ambassador Spencer, did you want to say anything? Okay, no. Uh, all right. Since we are on, uh, right on time, um, I would like to really thank all of the panelists um, for very fantastic uh, points and different perspectives. I think that really enriched our discussion. It is very difficult to sum up this debate because we have uh, so many open avenues, but I think we put things in perspective from our perspectives, whatever we could. And at the end of the day, I would always say, um, as I think Jonathan mentioned, that trade is a means, not the end. Uh, and then in the overall, you know, SDGs uh, uh, type of fra framework, we understand that trade is one of the means of implementation that was recognized. But my pet point is that if you look at trade from a transactional perspective, that looks very different if you look at trade from a developmental perspective. Trade is a tool. It is up to us, how do we use the trade to achieve food security or to achieve the sustainability? We can certainly do that. There are examples. It is only how do we use trade as a tool? And there are three things my previous boss used to say, there's a trade, there is a trade policy and there is a trading system. All three have to be in sync. So as it was mentioned by Mr. Spencer as well, we have to have the trading system, which is essentially the WTO and many other regional organizations and agreements that have to be in sync with the developmental object, objective and the sustainability objective of the trade. So with that, since it is 4.30, I think before we are taken off by the organizers, thank you very much once again. Thank you very much to the participants for their questions as well, and wish you all a very good afternoon. Goodbye.
Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.